Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. I'm a soldier for Christ. I'm a soldier for Christ. I'm a soldier. No, they'll never take us under, because we're bringing truth like thunder. Raining on your speakers like a ton of bricks. Hold the cross high, cause we're Catholics. Fight the good fight with the truth. Stand tall with the truth. I'm a warrior for Christ. I'm in love with the truth. Love God, save souls, slay error. Go stronger. We're called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Those who tell you the truth love you. And those who don't tell you the truth, they love themselves. Amen. Terry and Jesse show. We're here to tell you the truth. You know why? We love you. You're our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is High Energy Catholic Radio, Holy Hour of Power. This is where we engage the culture of death with uh, the truth of the Catholic faith, prayer, fasting, and full contact Catholicism. Terry, are you here? I'm here. I just can't. You can't see me, brother. But are you, you can, reporting? I'm reporting for duty, sir. And I'm pot fired up from having a restful weekend. Yes, I I read several books. I've thought about a lot of things that are going on in our culture. And man, I'm fired up because I'll tell you why. God has given us an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And I'm fired up because our first topic after the gospel and Sheen, I we're, I love the way you you name this show. A brave, manly, orthodox cardinal sounds the alarm. And I love cardinals like this. But let's, uh, let's get into some soul food here. Again, if you're brand new listening to the Terry and Jesse show, we're two evangelical Catholics with PhDs in common sense, and common sense ain't that common. So we read the gospel of the day from the daily readings. Jesse, can you share some gospel food with us today? Matthew chapter 17, Mm -hmm. verses 22 to 27. You got it. There's two sections here in today's gospel. First of all, our Lord, our blessed Lord, he foretells his death and resurrection. And then he talks about the requirement to pay Caesar the temple tax. Here's what it says. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. So right here, Jesus Christ is predicting his impending death and his resurrection. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty obvious that the apostles still don't understand God's plan of salvation because they didn't like what they heard. It says when they heard this, they were deeply distressed. Verse 24. When they came to Capernaum, the uh, the Collectors of the half shekel tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher pay the tax? He said, Yes. And when he came home, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take toll or tribute? From their sons or from others? And when he said, From others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook. And take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them, give it to them for me and for yourself. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. A couple of things I want to mention. <clears throat> this uh this little t- town called Capernaum, yeah. that, that was Jesus' hometown. Okay. Uh <clears throat> he he lived in the in the area called Galilee, but there was a little town in Galilee called Capernaum. For those of you that it'll be easier for you to think about county, think about uh, 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 Galilee was like the county and Capernaum would be like the city. And so now what's this thing about this half shekel? Because we don't use this language uh, as Americans. What's this half shekel tax? This literally, this was the, the, the amount of money that was required every single year of all male Jews over 20 years old. So that was the annual tax. It was called a half a shekel. Hmm. Also, something very interesting where it talks about in the Bible where it says that he went up to Peter, okay? Where it says that he went up to Peter. That's pretty interesting because those, I think those three, four words, excuse me, it kind of demonstrates Peter's primacy or the primacy of Peter. And, uh, and, and here the tax collectors, 
they recognize and they approach Peter, not the other 11. They approach Peter as the apostle's spokesman. And also, finally, where Jesus Christ talks about in verse 26, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. What does that mean? The sons are free. As Catholics, the sons are free. That means for us divine sonship. That means we share uh, in Christ as a result of baptism. We become adopted sons and daughters of God through baptism. And uh, as a result of that, even though we belong to God, we still have to submit to Caesar in some of those things that are lawful. For example, paying taxes. Although we belong to God, again, we still live on planet Earth, and there are still some things that we owe to Caesar. So that's the point that's being made there. And uh, and finally, in verse 27, we're, uh, talk about a miracle. Mm-hmm. Jesus tells Peter, go and uh, put a hook and grab this fish and, and pull the fish up. And in the fish's mouth, you're going to find the money that you need to pay the taxes. I mean, if somebody would tell you that, hey, go out to Suma <laughs> Beach and go fishing, and, the, and you're going to catch a fish and then open its mouth, and then the money that you're going to get from inside this fish's mouth in Zuma Beach, you're going to be able to pay your house taxes. If somebody was able to do that to you, you'd say, whoa, <laughs> this guy must be God because what he asked me to do is so crazy and, and, and exactly what he told me to do, I did. And I found money in a fish in Zuma Beach's <laughs> mouth fishing and I paid my house taxes for California. Yep, there is nobody like Jesus. <laughs> Amen to that, Jesse. You got more to say? Go ahead, Jess. That's it. I'm okay. done. Here's what I want to just say. <clears throat> Folks, much of what Jesse is doing is what they call exegesis. In other words, explaining the Bible. And I just want to remind everybody, tomorrow, Bible with the Barbers, my wife's going to be at a funeral, and I'm going to take St. Ignatius of Loyola and use his principles on meditating on God's Word And also, I'm going to give you 10 things you need to do before you die. That's going to be with the Bibles on the Barbers. That's right after the Terry and Jesse show tomorrow. But I'd like to bring the smartest guy in the room in on a train. Hey, Mr. Engineer, put that, that, hey, whistle there. Full Sheen ahead. Jess, I want your comment on this because Bishop Sheen talks about something that I think has been true for 2,000 years. He says, One great mysterious fact that is not generally known to the world is wherever there is persecution on the account of the faith, it always results in a vast catch of souls for the kingdom of God. Tertullian was right when he said, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. Jess, I'm going to give an example, and then I want your take on it. Ireland. When Ireland was persecuted... The Catholic Church was very, very strong. People, I know uh, families that were there, and they told me, man, I'll tell you what, uh, we were under persecution, and we knew uh, that uh, you live your Catholic faith, even if it's underground. We were living it silent, you know, we're going to Mass in secret. That's right, people in Russia, when the persecution went on. Uh, Bishop Athanasius Snyder is an example. Just does that make sense And when it comes with, to persecution, the faith is strong to you? Yeah, I'll tell you why tell the historians, Catholic historians, will, will say that this is the, the reason. is yeah. because under persecution, you have to ask yourself, okay, this is uncomfortable. I'm being persecuted for following Christ and for being a Catholic. Yeah. So you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? Yeah. And at that moment, you start asking yourself questions that you've probably never asked before yeah. if you're living in comfort. When you're living in comfort, watching television all day, eating donuts, and watching your stomach grow and burping <laughs> and just... Uh, <laughs> Just enjoying the easy life. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't think about the tough questions, but when you're being persecuted by Russians, communists, you know, by yeah. communists, Russia, China, yeah. you know, North Vietnam, Islamist terrorists. Yeah. And, and, and you're asking yourself, OK, is this true? Is Jesus Christ God or is this whole thing a lie? Is this all made up? Is the Catholic Church, was it established by Christ? Is Christ really present in the Eucharist? See, at that moment. You have to really do some deep soul searching and introspection and saying, if these things are true and if there's life after death, then then I'm going to put up with some suffering as uncomfortable as it may be, because I want to get that 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 ultimate prize, which is heaven, the new Jerusalem. But if this is not true, if this is just Pollyannish, you know, uh, you know, urban legends, 
uh, I'm out of here. I, I'm not going to uh, allow myself to, and my family to be persecuted for something that's a lie, for something that's a fabrication, for something that's a myth. So, yeah, Terry, persecution has always caused Catholics to, to ask the deep questions. Is the gospel true? Is Jesus Christ uh, who he says he is? Yeah. And, uh, and as a result of that, uh, the church becomes stronger because the evidence for Christ being who he says he is is, uh, is overwhelming. And uh, people realize, you know what, this, this persecution is just going to be for a short little while, and then I'm going to be with Jesus. Well said, Jesse. In my 40 years and your 30 years of evangelization, you and I have both met many people coming back to the church through apologetics in defense of the faith. They come and say, my neighbor asked me, why do you Catholics go to your confession? And I couldn't tell him why. So I had to look it up. I didn't have to, I had to go find out about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. I had to find out about the authority of the church. I had to find out about the scripture. The Catholic Church has the answers. The challenge is many people aren't looking for them. You know why? Because what Jesse just said, comfort. It makes you comfortable if you got, hey, you got a check coming in. The government's your God. Uh, why should I go turning to God when I got all the food and shelter? I don't need anything. Well, I'll tell you what, when that exit interview comes in, you won't be looking for Uncle Sam because he won't be there. Yep, and that's why Tertullian said it. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You got it. The more they persecute us, the more we grow. Hey, Jess, when, yeah. no, do we, we, when we, could, we come back from this break, I got fired up because I love when— I, I like masculine Catholic th theology, okay? I like men who love Jesus Christ aren't afraid to say it. I love cardinals who say, hey, this isn't politically correct, but you know what? I love you so much, I'm going to tell you the truth. And that's what Cardinal Burke did. And when we come back, we'll tell you what he did, in which I wish all cardinals and all bishops and all priests and everyone would do out of love. Tell people the truth. We'll be back with the Terry and Jesse Show on Virgin Most Powerful. We give it charity and clarity here. We'll turn that dial. This is Mary Danielle Barber, and I would like to invite you to join us here at the Sacred Heart Chapel in downtown Covina for a true femininity, be who you are, women's conference, Saturday, September 7, 2019, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Barbara Nicolosi and I will be speaking. It's $35 a person, and you can register at virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. We hope to see you at the women's conference, September 7, 2019. Jesus said to the apostles in Luke chapter 10, Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. According to St. Boniface, in her voyage across the ocean of this world, the church is like a great ship being pounded by the waves of life's different stresses. Our duty is not to abandon ship, but to keep her on course. May our Lord help us remain ever faithful to his church to aid and defend her. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we come to understand. According to St. Augustine, understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand that you may believe, but believe that you may understand. May God grant us a strong living faith in Him and His divine plan of salvation and help us to believe so that we may understand. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Bishop David O'Connell, and you're listening to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 
1-800-242-2151. Here's Terry and Jesse. We want to highlight two brave cardinal successors of the apostles. <clears throat> this is what the church needs more and more of. Yep. People like Cardinal Raymond Burke and Cardinal George Pell. This is what the church, we need hundreds of cardinals and bishops just like this. Yep. Why do I say that? Because as Catholics, the church goes where its leaders take us. Yeah. To quote Monsignor Kelly. Yep, George Kelly. Uh, <clears throat> the fact is, as lay Catholics, we, we're just as foot soldiers. We need direction. We need marching orders. We need doctrinal clarity. Amen. We need moral clarity. And here are two cardinals that are giving us exactly what the church needs in our day and age. Let me profile the first one. Cardinal Raymond Burke, <clears throat> he he warned last Thursday, he warned pro-abortion Catholic politicians not to show up for Holy Communion because he says, you're not following Christ. He was interviewed on Fox News, and, and, and Cardinal Burke said that, look, and I'm not trying to punish pro-abortion politicians. What I'm trying to do is help them to repent. Amen. I'm trying to urge them to repent. He said this, quote, they may not present themselves to receive Holy Communion because they're not in communion with Christ. Cardinal Berg says, this is not a punishment. It's actually a favor to these people to That's tell right. them, don't approach because if they approach, they commit sacrilege. And, uh, and the article goes on to mention, obviously, prominent Catholic politicians like House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who's always, she never misses the opportunity to call herself a devout Catholic. And also former Vice President Joe Biden, another guy, never misses the opportunity to call himself a devout Catholic. Yet both of them support abortion up to birth and even infanticide. And they also think that taxpayers should be forced to pay for them. And Colonel Burke is calling these so-called Catholic politicians that have confused many Americans about the Catholic Church's moral teachings, he's calling them to accountability, Terry. Jesse, you nailed it in this article from Life Psych News. You want to uh, lead it, read it. But here's the point that I'd like to make it practical to us. Yes, Saturday, every other Saturday I go to confession because I'm a sinner, okay? And I know it, and I need the sacrament of confession. But in practical applications, there were only about, well, there was one other person in line. Okay, so there was two priests here in Probably confession. Probably the same one that you was there two weeks ago. Yeah, that's right. So here's my point. I go to a parish there that has 3,000 people going to Mass on a Sunday, and about, I'll give an exaggeration, 50 people to 80 people go to confession on a week. Well, here's the point, Jesse. What Cardinal Burke is doing, and we're doing on Catholic Radio here at Virgin Most Powerful, is out of charity and our concern and love for you, if you haven't been to confession in over a month, you probably should you need to go to confession because in the world we live in, in, in America, there's so many temptations for mortal sin. Now, I'm not judging you. What I am telling you as a spiritual fitness trainer is Cardinal Burke's telling those politicians not to go to a communion. And you know what? Don't go to communion if you haven't been to confession in a long time. Go to confession on a regular basis because I'm going to tell you something. When you receive Holy Communion in the state of mortal sin, it's a sacrilege. And now you've really compounded the problem. Now, Jess, here's my take, and then you give me your take. Most parishes go to Holy Communion by the row. I think that's a mistake, okay? Absolute big mistake. I, I, it's a big mistake because it puts pressure on people. Oh, I just got to go because what will someone say if they don't see me go up to Holy Communion? Wrong. So I think, I mean, objective here. I say that... Cardinal Burke's telling us about politicians. I think it applies to me going to confession on a regular basis and you. Jess, my take on this is not just at my parish. Have you found that to be your experience that very few people are going to confession? Oh, of course, Terry. That's in every Catholic church you but, go to. You see the same people in the confession line, the same, virtually the same people. And, and I'll tell you, there's the pressure. Yeah. At, at, at Vatican II, post-Vatican II, to, mm -hmm. for everybody to go to Holy Communion. Yeah. Because here's what happens. They get ushers, and they go from row to row, and they actually extend their right arm out. They'll, they'll extend their right arm, like saying, okay, your, your row, let's go, get up. 
and they're waving you. You're all, people are sitting there. They're almost pressured because you're being to, you're being pointed at, yep. and then they're waving. Let's go next row. Okay, yeah. next row. It's as if it's like an assembly line. That's wrong. This weekend I went to the Latin Mass in San Fernando, Saint v- Vitus, because when I'm in Southern California. I go to St. Vito's, the Latin Mass, and uh, I probably wouldn't have moved from California because they just, they just uh, <laughs> built the church about a mile and a half away from my house where I used to live. <laughs> about two years after I moved out, the Latin Mass community comes up there. And I tell people I probably would have grinded it out had that happened. But, hey, be that as it may, it is what it is. So, yeah, I was there this Sunday it's, it's, at uh, 9 a.m. Holy Mass. There's no pressure. There's no, there's no uh, ushers going from row to row sticking their right hand out saying, Come on, next row, come on, and looking right at you. Come on, get up, next row. It doesn't happen there. People know intuitively, hey, uh, I'm not going to get up because I'm not ready. I'm not disposed to receive our Lord. I'm, not, I mean, I'm probably in mortal sin. And so there's no pressure at the Latin Mass. And also the beautiful thing there is that there was confessions 30 minutes before every Latin Mass. Beautiful. So people are saying, oh, man, I'm not ready to go. So people are standing in line for confession before. And, Terry, that is a huge problem because yes, it is. there's this pressure at the post-Vatican II Mass by the ushers for everybody to get up. And I'll tell you, just to back up what Terry said, there's three Navy SEAL Catholic saints that were asked the question, how often should a lay person go to confession? Let me give you the three because they're all in my book, Lord, Prepare My Hands for Battle with the footnotes. St. John Paul II was asked in, in, the, in the 80s, how often should a lay Catholic go to confession? He said, once a month minimum. That's yep. what he said. Yep. Okay? St. Padre Pio was asked in the late 60s, how often should a lay Catholic go to the sacrament of confession? He said, once a month. And in the book, which is called Life is Worth Living, I got the page marked up. I got a, I got a, a, a post-it note there. Yeah. Venerable Fulton Sheen, in the book he writes, lay Catholics should be going to confession once a month. So I'm going to stop here. Venerable Sheen, St. John Paul II, and St. Padre Pio says, lay Catholics, minimum once a month. I don't know about you, Terry, but that's good enough for me. It it doesn't get any better than that. Jesse, well said. And that's why I really encourage, like, if you'll notice at our conferences, we always have confessions going on because that's when you meet Jesus Christ. And if you haven't been to confession in a month and you're saying, well, it's kind of hard to do. Well, I'm instructing you as your spiritual fitness trainer. Go. And if you can't do it on Saturday evening, call your parish and make an appointment with the pastor or an associate. And say, Father, I want to I want to go to confession. And uh, if, if he can't do it, call another parish. It's that important. The, and Padre Peel said, or, no, Father Amorth, an exorcist, said that going to confession is more powerful than an exorcism. Just how can that be? It's simple. The, the way Father Amorth and Father Forte explain it, yeah. I'll make it simple. Yeah, make it simple. The sacrament of confession is a sacrament. An exorcism is a sacramental. There you go. So there's a distinction. A sacrament is more powerful than a sacramental. Yep. That's why confession is more powerful than an, than an exorcism by a priest. Got it. Because the sacrament of confession gives you sanctifying grace and removes the evil from your soul. Were, uh, were an exorcism major or minor, it doesn't give you sanctifying grace, not right. even if Father Morth would have done it right. or, or, or the Pope does it. You don't get sanctifying grace from a sacramental. You get, uh, you get signal grace, which means you get, you get now like St. Paul in Acts chapter 9 where God gave him signal grace, uh, and all of a sudden he says, Man, I'm a sinner. I got to change my life. And he had this this awakening. Yeah. Okay, that's what a sacramental will give you. It gives you that grace to to repent and that grace to realize that you're on the wrong road. But it doesn't give you sanctifying grace. It doesn't put the life of God in your soul. Well said. The next cardinal who I have great respect for, both of these men I've met, is Cardinal George Pell. Now, Jesse, he's been in prison, okay? And he's writing a letter. He's writing this from prison. Uh, from yeah. prison. I love this. Sounds like St. Paul. August 9th, he's writing a letter thanking the supporters for their prayers and saying he's disturbed by the preparation for the forthcoming Senate on the Amazon. Jesse, that shows me this man loves the church. He's sitting in prison. He's not going, oh, woe is me. No, he says he's offering up his suffering in prison 
for the good of the church. But he said the modern day saint in my book. I agree with you, Jess. I've spent a whole day with my family with him, and I'm going to stand by that. I think he's going to be exonerated in the next two weeks. It looks like they're going to come out and have that statement come out about his prison sentence. But Jess. Why don't you go ahead and point out what he said August Well, tell 1st. you actually met him. I oh, mean, I, you, are you kidding really me? To... I'll tell yeah. everybody. Not only did I meet him, I picked him up at the airport. I spent a whole day with my four kids in a van singing songs with him, going to dinner, going to um, – th- th- we went to museums with him because Father Fessio asked me to spend the day and show him some sites here in Southern California. He is – and uh, he's in love with Christ and his church – and he's well aware of the corruption. As a matter of fact, Jesse, I'll say it this way. That man was getting into the problems of the Vatican finances, and he was cleaning right. up a mess. And when he, when, when he got into too deep, they decided, hey, we got to stop this guy. That's my take on it. The circumstances are very, very evident that this was a man who caused trouble inside the Vatican where there was corruption going on, and they needed him out. But I'm going to tell you, Jess, he, in history, we're going to go back and see George Pell as a man who's a reformer. And the church always needs to be reformed. One of the great reformers, Terry, I, I of our agree. time. I agree. I agree. Terry, and, and here's what he's pointing out. He's Even from jail, he's still weighing in. I love he's, it. I love it. I'm a cardinal. I will, too. And, you know, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still a successor of the apostles. Yep. He's speaking out, Terry. Tell us. Tell us. Uh, about the dangers of the Amazon yeah. Synod. Oh, yeah. He's saying he loves that the, the church. The, He's saying Amazon Synod or no Amazon Synod, the Catholic Church cannot allow any confusion. Amen. And that's what he's pointing to. He's pointing to the, he's criticizing, Terry, the Synod document. Sure is. And this upcoming Synod in, in, in Amazon. He says, one point is fundamental. The apostolic tradition, the teaching of Jesus and the apostles, taken from the New Testament, taught by popes and councils, by the magisterium, is the only criterion doctrinally for all the teaching on doctrine and practice. He says, Amazon or no Amazon synod in every land, the church cannot allow any confusion, much less any contrary teaching to, je- to damage the apostolic tradition. And uh, Cardinal Pell from his jail cell, he's, yep. he's emphasizing the need for unity in the essentials of Christ's teaching, and he's also calling for, for charity in all things. And, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Terry... Cardinal Pell smells something fishy going on with this Amazon Synod, and he's talking about it even from his jail cell, like St. Paul did. And in the next two weeks, they're going to have another judgment on his case where he was accused of sexual misconduct, which was totally— uh, uh, Forty years ago. Uh, uh, yeah, and there's the witness. It's really, it's really bad. But i got to tell you, there are some people in the Vatican who aren't going to be too happy when he gets exonerated— because if he goes back into clean house, the modernists are going to have to gun running. And that's why my prayers are with him, because it's time to clean house. We need Terry, more cardinals like him. You know what the court like said? The court, the, the court president, Justice Chris, said, yeah. uh, that, the, that about Cardinal Pell, he said, this is wildly improbable, that's right. these allegations against him. Wildly improbable. Welcome, Daniel. You're on the line. What's on your mind, brother? Hi, I just wanted to share a testimony about Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I had a buddy at work who, you know, he's a lukewarm Catholic guy, and I wanted him to start listening to the Terry and Jesse show, so I kept telling him to download the app, and he kept putting me off. So one day, I grabbed his phone, and I downloaded the app (laughs) for him. I went on vacation, and you know, I kept telling him to listen to it. He was kind of put me off. I came back from vacation. He comes to my cubicle and he says to me, hey man, I've been listening to Terry and Jesse's show and it's great. And it's uh, made a big impact in his life. The guy, he's going to weekly adoration a couple times a wow. week. He goes to the mass in the morning. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he's an uh, on fire Catholic and he promotes uh, the Terry and Jesse show on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Wow, Daniel, what a testimony. And I want to encourage our listeners to get those cards by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, do what Daniel's doing. Go out and spread the faith by inviting people to listen to Virgin Most Powerful. Daniel, thanks for your testimony, brother. God love you. You're welcome.
This is Terry Barber reminding you, there's a women's conference coming up September 7th, 2019 at the Sacred Heart Chapel. Mary Danielle Barber will be speaking along with Barbara Nicolosi. They're going to be talking about true femininity, be who you are. This is going to be for your daughters, your mothers. Every woman should be at this conference. And the way to do it is go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. Is there a link between pot and mass shootings? <laughs> well, it may be closer than you think. Amen. You can't walk through the streets of Manhattan these days without smelling weed. You can't walk through the streets of any large city I was just gonna these days. That. Even a lot of just neighborhoods. Yep. You can't walk outside the neighborhood and not smell dope in the air. Yep. Okay? That's a fact. And and even as the evidence mounts of the health problems that are associated with marijuana, New York, for example, has insisted on joining other greedy states scrambling to legalize this deceptively dangerous drug. And it makes no sense at a time when American youth are suffering from an unprecedented mental health crisis And then here we are, legalizing marijuana. Are you kidding me? And in all honesty, uh, there's an article written by Miranda Devine. Talks about the the link between pot and mass shootings. Here's some of his best arguments. He says, in all honesty, we cannot rule out a connection between increasing marijuana use, mental illness, and the recent spate of mass shootings by disturbed young males. He says... We don't yet know much about the mental state or drug use of the El Paso or Dayton killers. But a former girlfriend of Dayton killer, Connor Betts, 24, has indicated he was mentally ill. And two of his friends interviewed by reporters this week mentioned his previous drug use. June last year, the parents opposed to pot lobby group tried to sound the alarm on the link between marijuana and mass shootings. And they compiled a list of mass killers it claims were heavy users of marijuana from a young age, from Aurora, Colorado shooter James Holmes, Tucson, Arizona shooter Jared Loeffner, to Chattanooga, Tennessee shooter Mohammed Abdulaziz. And until we understand these links, it's nuts to keep making these, you know, these lax laws that encourage more young people to use a drug that's proven to trigger mental illness. Terry? Jesse, you're the expert on this. You wrote a book on marijuana. And I want to direct people to go to jesseromero.com. Pick up his book, Mom and Dad. Every family needs this because, Jess, it's so rampant. I live in Southern California, and I don't think it's – I mean, everywhere I go, I see people smoking dope. And I'm just going to throw something that this article doesn't throw in, but your book covers it, regarding marijuana as a gateway drug getting into stronger drugs. That's a fact. And so when people try to tell me, oh, we just need to legalize marijuana, it'll be fine. Look at the states that have done this and look at the the increase of crime that comes in. So, Jesse, the facts, the, this is what I call the uh, inconvenient facts that people don't want to see because they want to see the money. In California, there's people getting to become millionaires because they're being able to sell marijuana and make a ton of money. But my point to you is it's not just corrupting our kids. It's it's causing a lot of violence. But also, Jess, let's face it. I read your book. What does it do to a young person's mind and motivation to go out and work and do things of value and, 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 even, and even turn to God? Very little. If anything, it drives them away. Yeah, Terry, doctors call it. They call it a disincentive drug. Yeah, right? meaning. And that- the, the word disincentive means mm-hmm. 
it it makes you lose your drive. Reason. You lose your ambition. Yep. You use you Motivation. you lose your zest for life. Yep. You you lose that zeal to uh you know to change the world. You're describing because you, yeah because that, uh, uh, Terry You're- marijuana what it does it makes you stupid. What it does it darkens your intellect and it makes you lose your free will. That's basically it. Drug addicts, drug users, they they lose their free will. They hand over their free will to Satan. Yep. That's the essential argument from a Catholic point of view. That's right. And Jesse, I just want to make the connection. A lot of these shooters have had marijuana uh, use. Uh, They they have a a next article later. We're going to talk about a uh, criminology professor with a study about every mass shooting since 1966. There's consistently people who forget about wanting to live, number one. They're on They're high. They've either used marijuana or some other drug. They've, they've, they're depressed. All these characteristics, what we're doing right now is we're allowing our culture to get more screwed up, excuse the French, in the sense of its, its meaning and purpose of life. And when people use drugs, then they will do anything, even shooting people, innocent lives. And what else that happens, Jesse, is with marijuana, you nailed it, you're losing your free will. And this is number one for us Catholics to say, wait a minute, the only value in saying yes to God is we have the freedom to say no. And your book, again, I want to recommend, because this article's good, Jess, but you, you've answered all the objections when it comes to marijuana. So Well, I, 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 give, a, I give a more complete argument. You do. I, I, I come at it from about six points of view. Yeah. And I've had a lot of young people, when I go and lecture places, they come up right. to me and they say, thank you very much exactly. for that marijuana book. My parents bought it. It's always parents that buy it. Young people Lord. will buy it. The parents buy it. Young people email me, Facebook me, text me, yeah. tell me in person. They said, I read your book. You're the first Catholic that's ever given a systematic argument showing why marijuana is dangerous. And you come at it from, from uh, law, philosophy, scripture, yep. science, medicine, and common sense. So I argue for a young person I give a complete response to them, and uh, I don't know how many uh, times I've been told by young people, I got off of marijuana cold turkey once I finished reading your book. I have never heard a, a, a Catholic argue like you, and yeah. the fact of the matter is we do have the arguments. We just have to use them. If anybody's interested in my book, it's called 50 Reasons Why Marijuana is Dangerous. Just go to my website, jesseromero.com, Jesse Romero. This problem is not going away, Terry. Yeah. It's not going away, and I'm going to tell you, Here's an argument that young people say, just the, the way you argue, just some of these arguments, I mean, I, I wasn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't overcome yeah. your arguments. Here's the one I use. I say, look it, here's basic Catholic moral philosophy, okay? It's, it's pretty simple. It comes from the Middle Ages. It's do good and avoid evil. Exactly. Okay? So let's hold to that. Do good and avoid evil. That's Catholic moral philosophy 101. All right. So can you do good if you're intoxicated? Everybody will agree, no, nah, not really, because you lose, you lose a proper use of your faculties, yep. the intellect, and, and reasoning, because reason goes out the window. I said, okay. And so, so you're going to admit to me that if you lose your sobriety, you're probably going to do evil, right? Probably. Okay, so here's the path to getting to heaven. It's pretty simple. Father Calloway actually mentioned this years ago. He says, number one, sobriety. Lead a sober life. Number two, sobriety leads to virtue. What is virtue? Mm-hmm. Good moral excellence. Number three, virtue leads to holiness. Number four, holiness leads to get to God in heaven. Simple. But you can't get to heaven if step one of their ladder is, is not there, and that's sobriety. You can never live a life of virtue if you're a drug addict or an alcoholic, and you can never lead, lead a life of holiness if you're always intoxicated with drugs or alcohol, and you'll definitely never be a saint in heaven if you're a drug addict or an alcoholic. Do- Father Calloway, yep. uh, he told me just, uh, if I would have read your book 30, 40 years ago, I would have never got into the life of drugs. I said, Father, I didn't write it 40 years ago. I just wrote it five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, just a fact, Sergeant Friday, you know, youth suicide is at an all-time high rate a serious mental illness in this country is on the rise. And guess what age group, Jesse, that is? The age group between 18 and 25, 
and these are the most likely age group that's using marijuana. Do you think there's a connection with suicide? Do you think there's a connection with mental health regarding marijuana? I think so, Jesse. Uh, and the facts are the facts. And that's why I say if it wasn't because they were making so much money here uh, selling marijuana, they wouldn't do it. But we're, we're looking the other way because, you know, money talks. Who cares about those kids? We care enough to tell them to not smoke marijuana, to not do drugs, because it's not only good for the salvation of their soul, which is good, but even for our country, Jesse. Can you imagine how many man hours we lose because they're stoned and they're not going to work? I saw studies showing that one of the big problems of people not showing up for work is because either they're drunk or they're high on drugs and they can't make it to work. So it's affecting all aspects of life. Terry, here's what's crazy. Tell me. We, we've demonized cigarettes, and yeah. I've been a cigarette I smoker, so I could care less. Yeah, I, I, I got no dog in that fight. No, I, don't I, don't, either. I never liked cigarettes. I never smoked yeah. cigarettes, so I don't, I don't really care. But we successfully demonized cigarettes yeah. with, new, with, with all, you know, all, the, all these uh, commercials right. and stuff and advertisements. Right. And now we're, we're sending this mixed message because we're saying cigarettes are bad, Give me a- but marijuana is good. Are you kidding are me? Are you serious? This is nuts. And here's another argument from this article that I think is is is, is a very solid argument. Yeah. It says you can't address the youth mental health crisis without considering the effect of rising teen marijuana use. That's right. Among American teenagers, the drug's daily use has become as or more popular than daily cigarette smoking, according to the National Institute of Health. And it says uh, we've successfully demonized cigarettes while new laws send kids the message that marijuana is harmless. Yet we've known for more than a decade of the link between marijuana and psychosis, marijuana and depression, marijuana and schizophrenia. In 2007, the prestigious medical journal Lancet uh, recanted its previous benign view of marijuana, citing studies showing an increase in risk of psychosis of about 40 percent. And so you got a lot of medical studies here, Terry, showing the complete connection between young people using marijuana and mental illness called by different names, schizophrenia, psychosis, right. depression, mental illness. It's all documented by medical journals as a result of marijuana. And furthermore, yeah. there's another study that talks about the rise of, of and, and legalization of marijuana and violent crime in Alaska, Colorado, Oregon, Washington. Exactly. There's a sharp increase in violent crime. As a result of these states legalizing marijuana, there's a nexus, there's a connection. And Jesse, in addition to that, to make matters worse, marijuana sold at legal dispensaries today, they say it's five times more potent than the pot of the 1970s and 80s. Hey, we've got Xavier on hold. When we come back from the break, Xavier, we're going to get your question answered. You're listening to the Terry and Jesse show. Uh, My goodness, common sense ain't that common right now. Can you believe what's going on in our country? Here at Virgin Most Powerful, charity and clarity is what we're doing. Go turn that dial. We'll be back with more on the Terry and Jesse Show on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Ernesto from Long Beach. You know, I just wanted to comment, you know, and I just wanted to thank you guys. And I kind of wanted to encourage people that are listening, maybe that are not donating, you know, because honestly, I got to be honest, I used to think you guys were a little too over the top, time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. You That's know, right. If God gave us a lot, you know, and I'm, I have the blessing of listening to all this, I just want to call all the people, you know, I got five kids, you know, and I don't make a lot of money, and I'm still donating to you guys. God bless you, brother. You're amazing. We gotta. We have to do this. We have to do the extra. And it's not even the extra. People see it like it's extra. Kneeling for communion, saying your rosary, saying the Divine Mercy Chaplet. It is not extra. It's what the church tells us to do. Amen. You're a good man, brother. 30 years old, 29 years old, five kids, and I thank you guys. For everybody else, man, get on fire. Fight for the truth, man. I know what I'm telling you guys. There's I no love it. Out there. This is Terry Barber reminding you 
There's a women's conference coming up September 7th, 2019 at the Sacred Heart Chapel. Mary Danielle Barber will be speaking okay, along we'll, with we'll, Barbara we'll, we'll, Nicolosi. Bring bring, uh, We're going to be talking about true femininity. Be who you are. This is going to be for your daughters, your mothers. Every woman should be at this conference. And the way to do it is go to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. I know I'm wearing my shirt too blessed to be stressed, but I also want to add that Jesse and myself, we're too inspired to be tired, too protected to be dejected, and too renewed to be subdued. No, we're on fire for the Lord, and that's what we do here at Virgin Most Powerful. Javier in San Diego, welcome to the Terry and Jesse show, brother. What's on your mind? So, uh, last week, I think this year, Virgin Most Powerful Radio, yeah, at the work, but um, I know you guys were talking about the presence um, um, of Jesus Christ in the uh, Eucharist. The Eucharist. Yes. Yeah, so I wanted to know the difference between because last last week's reading yeah man talking about moses taking the the children of israel out of the desert yes and so the, they were being fed manna yes so i want to know the difference between manna and the eucharist and then i kind of thought it was funny how that report came out about pew uh, research yep. not believing in the yeah not believing in the presence yeah of, uh, about two-thirds the eucharist. Yeah. yep and so i was like those in the readings those guys were like grumbling they're like what are you giving us here what this is we want meat we want we want this we want that and they they, they were complaining about receiving the manna yeah and so it was kind of it was kind of um coincidental how i was thinking well these guys are getting manna like what's the difference between manna All right. and the eucharist great question go ahead jess then i'll shoot Good. yep yeah i'll just I'll, uh, yeah good question i'll just quote the catechism it's on paragraph 122 where it answers your question it's called it's called the principle of typology. Types, let me right. give you, let me define it in my own words then I'll read it from the catechism. I think my own words are simpler, okay? In the Old Testament and in, in, in or, this is a way of reading the Bible. It's been a, for 2000 years for Catholics. It's it's a way of called biblical hermeneutics and it's a way of reading the Bible. When we read about persons or places or events in the Old Testament, those things are a symbol or they foreshadow some future greater, much more glorious reality that's yet to come in the New Testament. So in other words, the Old Testament persons, places, and people and events prefigure the New Testament. So the Old Testament manna that you're talking about in the book of uh, Numbers and Exodus, as uh, it says in paragraph 122, it says this, the economy of the Old Testament was deliberately so oriented that it should prepare for and declare in prophecy the coming of Christ, Redeemer of all men. Even though they, they what? Old Testament, contains ma contain matters imperfect and provisional. The books of the Old Testament bear witness to the whole divine teaching of God's saving plan. So what did it say this? All the stories in the Old Testament and people are imperfect. Adam, David, Moses, all the events are imperfect. They're provisional because all the events point to Jesus and his perfection in the New Testament. So what does that mean in relation to your question? The manna in the desert spoken of in Numbers chapter, I think it's uh, it's in the book of Numbers, chapter 20, I think, where it talks about manna rained from heaven upon the children of Israel and fed them every day. That was an imperfect and provisional type of Eucharist. And so now the Eucharist is the perfection 
It's the fulfillment of that, of, of that bread of heaven that reigned at the time of Moses. The bread of heaven that we have at Holy Mass is the perfection. It's the reality. It's the fulfillment of everything that was being hinted at in the Old Testament. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And it, I, uh, I just yeah, I'll make it easier. I'll make it easier. Okay, if I stand outside here in Arizona and it's, you know, the sun's out there, I'm going to cast a shadow, okay? The shadow that I'm going to cast, that's, that shadow is the Old Testament. Me, the person of Jess Romero, that's the New Testament. So that shadow points to me. That imperfect representation of me, the shadow on the street, it points specifically to me on the reality of that shadow. That's what we mean when we talk about biblical typology. Javier, this is Terry. I'm going to recommend, because I know you're seriously looking into this. Scott Hahn did a 12-hour course at Steubenville. You can spend $1,000 to take the class or, you know, call me at 877-526-215, and I'll put it on CD. It's a uh, called Typologies in the Old Testament. Jesse's already heard the class. I know that because I remember him listening to it. <laughs> and so if you want to really get into Typologies of Christ, Dr. Han does a whole course on that, and that would be my recommendation, brother. All righty? Yeah, but if you get a pencil, I, put, put uh, paragraph 122 of the, the catechism, catechism that gives paragraph. you the definition. There you go. Paragraph 122. You yeah. got it. All right, Javier. All right, hey. Will you with one more question? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Before Victor. Yeah, go ahead. When, when religious, when religious uh, oppose kneeling and receiving on the tongue, how, how do you guys react to that? Well, I give them the Vatican document that if you email me, I'll send it to you. Uh, the Vatican said that it is uh, a liturgical abuse not to allow people to receive Holy Communion on the tongue or kneeling. And it's uh, um, I've given this document to many people and many priests, if you do it humbly, they go, oh, I didn't know that. My diocesan told me that in the, my diocese that we're not supposed to do that. But if the Vatican says that, well, then now you can kneel and you can receive on the tongue. So it's just that a lot of times people aren't informed. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. So okay. email now, me. Now, now right. that's, for, that's for if a priest is on the right side of the issue. That's the way he's going to react. <laughs> yeah. If a priest is a modernist. Oh, he can care less. The priest is a modernist. He doesn't care because modernists want to destroy the Catholic Church. Yeah. They know how to destroy it by promoting dissent and disobedience to the church's authentic liturgy. So if if, if you got a priest that just doesn't know yeah. and you give them a document, oh, yeah. like Terry said, yeah. then then problem solved. But if you got a priest that's well, going to say, not in my parish, you're not going to do that. Uh, if I were you, I'd find another parish because yeah. he's violating your canonical rights. Yeah. But since he's a pastor, there's not much you can do about it. So I would just find another parish. If he's going to if he's going to take a hard line and say, I don't care what the Vatican says, you're not going to kneel down in my parish. I say, really? Well, me and my family and my donations were going elsewhere. Amen. Well, we'll trip out on this. So today, the first <laughs> reading was about um, the, the priest gave a homily about um, not being racist and not and accepting um, sure. aliens because there was something mentioned in the first reading mm -hmm. today. So then um, he gave this whole speech about not being um, not holding uh, grudges against everybody. So then I just felt like, well, what a privilege! Here I am kneeling and receiving on the tongue. Like, why, like, don't be racist against me yeah. because I'm received. Yeah. Javier, let me just throw this at you, brother. I've been around 40 years. I've had many priests tell me that. I, and here's my line that I give them, and then I walk away. Father, would you please give me what Holy Mother the Church teaches and not your personal opinion? As a matter of fact, my personal opinion is not important, and yours isn't either, because you were ordained to give what Christ taught. Would you implement that, please? And God bless you, Father. <laughs> I've said that to them, and they look at me like, What? Hey, listen, we got Victor on the other line. I got to get to him. We're praying for you, brother. Javier, you call in any time, brother. I hope that helped. All right. God love you. Victor and Chino, you've been waiting a long time, brother. Victor, what's on your mind? You're well, You're here on the Terry and Jesse show. What's going on, Terry? Hey, brother, we're too blessed to be stressed, but we're glad to have you on board. What's up? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a, a quick uh, Little uh, what happened this weekend on Saturdays once a month I, I go to confession with my whole family. Good job, at Victor. This church, right in this church in Montclair. Yes. But I've noticed um, every time we go, there's a lot of people, and they only give confessions from four o'clock to about four forty-five <laughs> or mass starts at five. Yeah. Now when you got twenty people, they're never going to have time not. to confess everybody. Yes. My thing is this: this past uh, 
weekend with my family. Well, of course, there were 20 people that didn't get confessed. The father comes out, and I, I got upset, and I was going to say something, but I, I kept my mouth shut. Yeah. And he pretty much gave everybody there an absolution. General absolution. And, yep. Yeah, and, and pretty much said, oh, you could go to confession. Yeah. Now, is that right, what, what he did? Is, is that um, – Okay, are you work? ready? Hey, Victor, before I give you an answer, brother, come on down to Sacred Heart Chapel at 9 o'clock for Holy Mass. We have confessions before Mass. That'll never happen. And we have a very reverent Mass, the Anglican Ordinate, which is part of the Catholic Church. So I think I know you, Victor. So bring your family at 9 a.m. when I'm there every Sunday. And I'll tell that to everybody. You don't have to put up with that. That's just wrong, okay? What that priest did is he was lazy. Okay, Jesse, I said it in charity. And I would pray for that priest that he would come back and, and realize that, uh, Father, how long are you hearing confessions each week? We got we to gotta make, John Paul II said to the priest, get, make yourself available for confession. And unfortunately, in most parishes, that means 45 minutes a week. And that's not enough. Right. Jess, that's you not tell enough. me I'm wrong on that, Jess. Go ahead. No, let me just uh, Brutal. Say, say what a, a general, general absolution is this power that's been given to Catholic priests in case of an emergency. Yeah, like a in other zone. words, if there's an earthquake yeah. and, 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 you know, and, and all of a sudden all, you know, 90% of the Catholic churches are knocked down to the ground. Yep. Or if we get attacked by communists, you know, they come in with, you know, fighter planes yeah. and, and helicopters and tanks and they, they destroy the entire diocese of Riverside or Orange County. If you see a priest out there, a priest can pray and raise his hand and absolve all the Catholics that that uh, that want to receive confession, but they can because all the churches have been destroyed as a result of an earthquake, a fire, a war or something. It's supposed to be used in case of emergency. It's not it's it's illicit. It's unlawful to use it. Just like, oh, there's a lot of people in line. OK, I can't get to you here. Let me raise my hand and pray for all of you. Your sins are forgiven. I'll give you the classic example when it was used very publicly, and a lot of people know about it. At 9-11 attacks at the World Trade Center, yep. there was several priests that I know of. One died. They were underneath the building as the buildings were coming down, and they put their stole on, and they were raising their hand and giving general absolution as people were jumping off the building and as there was a, a, a towering inferno of the World Trade Center. That's when it's supposed to be used in case of an emergency yep. to have the power to forgive people's sins. You got it. It was also used at the Titanic. There was another priest at the Titanic yep. as the ship was going down. Catholics and non-Catholics, the priest has the power to forgive their sins in case of emergency and a general absolution. But that's in very specific instances like the Titanic or the World Trade Center. Not that's because... Right. Father uh, is lazy and only giving a 45-minute confessions on Saturday. Yeah, Victor, I want to also invite you and all of our listeners on the 19th to the 21st of August. We're going to have three evenings of recollection on the work of the Holy Angels. Confessions going on for three hours each night. What? Yes. Uh, so I want you to bring your family to either Sunday Mass at 9 o'clock here at the chapel or come on the 22nd uh, to the 25th. I'm sorry, 19th to the 21st. Jesse, every single time we have a radio broadcast, we end with what is ultimately the most important decision of anyone's life, and that is what state you should you be living in. State of grace. Don't live in a state of mortal sin. As the catechism says, confess your sins to God every day, your venial sins. Before you go to bed, examine your conscience. Take a look at your day. Say a good act of contrition out of love for God, not out of the fear of hell, out of love for God. And uh, if you have a mortal sin, as the catechism says, go to a priest as soon as possible. But if you have venial sins, catechism says every night, confess those before God. Up next, Dr. Ed Mazza, the bar of history. You won't want to miss Dr. Mazza. Every time I hear him, I learn something. May God richly bless you and your family. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests. Oh, my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole church, Grant it love and the light of thy spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great high priest, may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere. 
and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.